Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome to Mysterious Galaxy on this brisk Monday evening. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Jenny. I'm one of the co-owners of Mysterious Galaxy. I'm going to be the in-conversation partner tonight. Um, and you all are here to see Claudia Gray. And so I'm going to do a brief bio and we will jump to the conversation. Um, we'll talk for 30 minutes and then kind of go to audience questions. So um, uh, think of questions now yes. so that we don't have that really long, weird, awkward gap. <laughs> yes. And Stop shout out on it. Just formulate. <laughs> shout out to our online viewers as well. Questions over there. That's probably not the angle of the camera. Am I pointing at the camera? Okay, cool. <laughs> we, we have our hybrid events now, so that's really fun. Okay. Um, Claudia Gray is the pseudonym of Amy Vincent. She's the writer of multiple young adult novels, including the Evernight series, the Firebird trilogy, and the Constellation trilogy. In addition, she's written several Star Wars novels, such as Lost Stars, my favorite, and Bloodline. Um, she makes her home in New Orleans with her husband, Paul, and in perhaps the most Austinian part of the bio, an assortment of small dogs. Yes. Um, all right, so we're gonna start with a little bit of a speed round to get some hot takes on Jane Austen and then maybe s some crossover elements as well. Um, all right, so how were you first exposed to Jane Austen? I read Pride and Prejudice and Emma for various college classes and I enjoyed them, but they didn't really take I didn't mm -hmm. become a fanatic at that time. I just thought, oh, it looks great. And then came 1995, which was kind of the as miraculous, I don't know how to speak Latin, um, of Austin adaptations because we got the great Pride and Prejudice, the great sense of sensibility, great persuasion. And then I went and revisited these books because you just get all oh, this great Austin. And then the books, of course, pulled me in under their own power. But it was just a year before. It was everywhere. It was so great. Oh, nice. Um, what is your favorite adaptation of a book or of Austin's work overall? Uh, I've, I've got to go with a 95 Pride and Prejudice, uh, although I probably have watched the Only Sense of Sensibility even more. Um, the best Emma for me is the one with Rama Garai and Johnny Miller. I think that one is delightful. Uh, they had no good Northanger Abbeys until 2007, and that phenomenal one with Felicity Jones mm -hmm. and, oh gosh, what's her name, Carrie Mulligan and J.J. Field, and nobody has yet nailed Mansfield Park. Mansfield Park is tough. <laughs> it's hard. There, it's there tough. are versions that get one part of it or another part of it, but nobody's quite got their mm -hmm. cinematic hold on it yet. Nice. Um, Sense and Sensibility is my favorite. It's really so. great. I mean, every once in a while, I would say maybe like twice a week, there's something in my husband or I will pause and go, mm -hmm. in the best sense <laughs> way that, that Alan Rickman think, does. Yeah, I think it's, you shout it out in the forward mm -hmm. and I was like, yes, that's when I knew. I was like, I'm going to like this. I love <laughs> Sense and Sensibility. Um, what Austin character do you most identify with? I mean, in my heart of hearts, I, I hope I'm Elizabeth Bennet. I think we all kind of hope that. There's probably a stronger resemblance to Emma than is comfortable, unfortunately. So that's in there, too. That was the next question. Oh, was like, who do you aspire to be? Uh -huh. Who do you really think you are? Yes. Uh, what character do you think deserves more credit or attention? Ooh, that's interesting. Um... You know, I had fun writing her in this book. I'm actually going to say Fanny Price from Mansfield Park. She is the character least like our ideal of a modern heroine. She's very passive. She's very timid. She's very unsure. Things have to kind of happen to her. The only action she takes in the entire book is saying no. And it's a very powerful no, but that's it. Mm -hmm. And... I think it's interesting to look at her. That's one mistake a lot of the adaptations made. They try to make her something she's not so that she'll be like a modern heroine. It's like her choices don't make any sense mm -hmm. if you do that. Uh, I would really like to see somebody dig in on that. I really love the way in The Murder of Mr. Wickham that you kind of bring in that no mm -hmm. 
put again in, in a very kind of not necessarily surprising way, um, especially if you know the characters, but in kind of a turn of events that mm -hmm. I think is a good moment um, that everybody should find when they read The Murder of Mr. Wickham. <laughs> um, all right. What character do you want to go to lunch with? Ooh, We're going to get a little bit more playful now. That's interesting. Um, Mr. Knightley would be very fun at lunch. Actually, Mr. Tilney, I think, is going to be my vote. He's definitely the wittiest of the, hero, of the heroes, mm -hmm. uh, and I think he's delightful. I think that would be very enjoyable. And he would also know the best places. I'm confident about that. That is key yeah. in a lunch date. Yeah. Uh, what character would be most likely to bail you out of jail? Ooh, I guess the question is, what am I in jail for? <laughs> Oh, gosh. Murdering Mr. Wickham? Uh, yeah, that's going to be... I don't know about bail in that case. <laughs> um, you know what? I bet Emma's a good person to get for that because, one, she's sort of independently wealthy. She has control, <laughs> more control over her money than most people and has more of it. And also, if I spin a good enough story about why I'm in there, she will believe me. <laughs> that's fair. Would you rather have Mrs. Bennett as a mother or Sir Walter Elliot as a father? Oh, ouch. Why? I, it's oh, like a cursed question. <laughs> oh. There's going to be another cursed question. That you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm actually going to go with Mrs. Bennett as a mother because I read something years ago that really made me think. It was like, yeah, she's unbearable a lot of the time, but it was like the crisis her daughter's face is real and in her own misguided way, she's doing her best for them. Mm -hmm. which is something that Mr. Bennett does not do uh, as much as we love it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, well, I didn't think I'd say, and then it was too late. And it's sort of like, <laughs> you know, you're really lucky bar that Bingley like Netherfield is very, very lucky. Uh, whereas Sir Walter Elliot is just, he's nothing but contemptuous mm -hmm. of Anne and he does not do anything. Um. I'm going to go to the other cursed question next. Kiss, Mary, kill, Wickham, Willoughby, or Mr. Collins? Oh, you yeah, throw Mr. <laughs> Collins in there. And throw Mr. Collins in there. All right, well, now i got to marry Willoughby, which, I mean, it's going to be fun for a little while at least. Yeah. So that's all right. Um, I think yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to the, really quickly <laughs> kiss Mr. Collins on the cheek. Like, you know? And then, like, run in the other direction. Yeah, because, I mean, he's sort of he's sort of unbearable, but he, he doesn't, like, go around viciously <laughs> hurting people. And Wickham does. So, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I have to listen. Um, good. What is your most controversial Austin opinion, do you think? Ooh, what is mine? Uh, I know a lot of people out there, purists out there, do not like the um, 1990s adaptation that also Johnny Lee Miller, we have him again as uh, Edmund, uh, because it's a very revisionist take. Mm -hmm. And it points out things like, uh, you know, the, the money for Mansfield Park, that comes from a plantation in mm -hmm. the Caribbean. Uh, and there are hints of that in the book. Uh, Jane Austen was anti-slavery, and you, you have a moment where Fanny tries to raise a question about it, and of course mm -hmm. the conversation just gallops on over her. Um, I actually think a lot of the questions it asks are, are very fair questions, and a lot of the stuff it points out bears looking at, and I think they do it in a wonderfully satirical way. The problem is they replace Fanny Price with a Jane Austen, like, would-be mm -hmm. writer, again, a person who would not make the choices that this character makes for the story to go forward. If I had that character in there, I would really, really extraordinary but a lot of people i don't know a lot of people kind of don't want to look at the underpinnings i think there's a way to do it and that movie did do it in a way that didn't sacrifice all of the wit and all of the energy mm -hmm. oh and related i don't know i don't even <laughs> think this is that hot a take i think there are a lot of people out there that are like we kind of like to see that ending where henry crawford guys act together it's more interesting let's just face it edmund come on there. just gotta get it together <laughs> a little bit all right um i agree i think that the like the not undertones but like the background the way colonialism comes in in the background in mansfield park but also like a lot of kind of writing at that time was always really interesting mm -hmm. um 
So now, now we've reached the Star Wars crossover section. Okay. What Austin character is most likely to use the Force? Mm. I, mean, I don't think she's most likely, but I just want it to be Mary Bennett. <laughs> Because right. all of a sudden, you know, because she's going to use the force and I think she's going to rise up as a Sith Lord and just take them all down for making fun of her. She was reading the ancient Jedi text that whole time and now I'm sorry. Which is the answer to the next question. Which one is most likely to go to the dark side? All right. So we'll, we'll go with Mary there. Let's go for an actual Jedi Knight. He would be a great Jedi Knight. I want to go think about it. Uh, you know, even though he is rather straight laced, I can see uh, Edmund being Edmund Bertram. Mm -hmm. He might be a little like Obi Wan, kind of a little bit too much about the rules, <laughs> but uh, but he is very, very good hearted, mm -hmm. and he is very focused on uh, the spiritual side of life, much more than any of the other clergy people mm -hmm. that Austin writes about. He's actually serious about it in a way that every clergy person was at that time. So I can buy him. Maybe. There you go. Um, what Star Wars character could enter the world of Austin most smoothly? Ooh, it's not Han Solo. No. <laughs> yeah, again, I sort of wish it were Chewbacca, you know, with this just like, like eating, popping up. Teacup in the big furry paw. <laughs> Indeed, Mr. Baca. You know. <laughs> that would be delightful. Um, you know, Leia could do it because, of course, she grew up in a royal palace and she can do the deportment and and etiquette mm -hmm. and all you know the very refined thing it's not who she really is but she can do it yes. um what austin character is most likely to unknowingly kiss a sibling i will <laughs> <laughs> wow mm. did anybody here read longborn the Pride and Prejudice story that was supposedly written from the point of view of the servants. No, I know what you're talking about, though. Yeah, uh, one of the servants was actually Mr. Uh, actually, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Re retreat, retreat, spoilers. You, you heard nothing. Um, gosh, hold on, let me think. There are unknowns. This one's tough. I'm not sure. I mean, you have a lot of cousins yeah. that kiss or want to kiss. Mm -hmm. So that may be as close as we can get there. But back then, you were pretty much going to know your siblings. That's true. Mostly. I mean, mostly. you have the illegitimate ones, but then they would be of such a character and class that you would not interact with them. Yeah. All right. And last Star Wars, last of the, the crossover, okay. or the speed round is what Austin character hates sand the most because it's coarse and rough and irritating and it gets everywhere. <laughs> uh, let's see. It is not anybody from Persuasion. They love the they beach. They love the beach. Yeah, they're good at that. Um, it's not Lydia. She's very happy at Brighton. So she's okay with sand. Um, let's see. You know, I think, I think, who would I say? Oh, I know, it's Mary Crawford from Mansfield Park. She <laughs> she can barely even rough it in terms of like a little English, English country village. Mm -hmm. that, that's too rugged for her. She can't stand it. Actual beach with actual sand. Oh, she hates it. <laughs> well, thank you for indulging me. In All right. um, now, can you please tell us a little bit about Murder of Mr. Wickham and how you came up with this idea? Okay, uh, I came up with this idea when, and this was more than a decade ago, but uh, the book of Death Comes to Pemberley comes out, and I'm a huge P.D. James fan, I'm excited about this, I get it, and I start reading, and this is a spoiler, but that book has been out for more than a decade, so, you know, and this isn't the big spoiler, but the person who gets killed is Benny, and I was like, well, who cares who killed Benny? Like, I've been so sure it was going to be Wickham, so sure, and Eventually, it's sort of It's like, I have to quit judging this book for not being the thing I wanted it to be and, like, look at it for its own merits, which are very strong. But it sort of kept going in my head, like, somebody on a kill book, and there's so many people with motive. And over time, it sort of took shape, it took form, and then it became that idea that uh, I'm guessing at least a couple of you out here are writers or aspiring writers, that idea that you talk about for years and your friends are like, uh-huh, yeah, and it just keeps on not happening. 
and then finally in, uh, I guess it was late 2019, I was like, you know what, if I'm ever going to do this thing, I need to sit down and do it. I was very uncertain that it would find a home in publishing, but I was like, I've got to at least try it because I'm never going to move on from <laughs> it if I don't. Um, so in Murder of Mr. Wickham, when I started reading it, and I know I told you this before, but I find your ability to sort of embody Jane Austen's voice and the characterization of these characters to be so spot on tonally um, for me, which is like a very nostalgic thing. So it, it was very reminiscent of that. Um, how did you hone that style? Like what kinds of things did you do to develop that, that precision? Well, there was a period of time where sort of before you had the Libby app or a lot of the things where, you know, but there was books, you know, the iPhones and books, they named it very artistically. Anyway, uh, I, the only books I had in there were the six Jane Austen novels. And so anytime I was waiting in the line or stuck at a thing and whatever, I would pull it out and I would just be reading it. And when I finished one, I would go to the one that I hadn't read in the longest time that out and I've read them over and over and over and there was a period that I would say of about three years where that was true. I mean I'd read them before, mm -hmm. I'd enjoyed them before. Um but that was probably the single biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Um and I do think it's worth paying attention to the adaptations that also capture that voice because you know one I could never write actual Jane Austen prose because she was so brilliant and so funny. But get a flavor of it mm -hmm. and the dialogue it, it's mostly hopefully Austin-esque but at the same time it has to be a little bit adapted to a modern audience and the best film and TV adaptations have done a good job of that and so it was worth listening to how they did it like one that I don't think did a very good job even though it's a very beautiful movie in a lot of ways is the 2005 Pride and you know, when you have Charlotte Lucas going, don't judge me. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, like, what, where did that come from? It was not, that doesn't belong in the year 1810. Or, you know, they actually put that one back around 1790, didn't they? Yeah. It doesn't belong there. It, it just, it just clangs against the ear. That's not it. Uh, so the ones that I thought really had captured it very well, I listened to that because that was some guidance from Emma Thompson, for instance, about how to sort of, shape the dialogue just a little bit so that it still had that Austin flavor, but would read uh, easily enough to a modern reader. Uh, what character was the most intimidating to write, the most enjoyable, and the most challenging? Mm. The most intimidating is definitely Elizabeth Bennet because uh, she is, she's very, very funny. She's very, very bright. And she's the one, I think, that is the most beloved. And it's sort of like I used to say about Bloodline. It's like the mm -hmm. best thing about writing Princess Leia is also the worst thing about writing Princess Leia, which everybody knows her and everybody loves her and everybody will kill for her. <laughs> and if you get it wrong, they will kill you. Nice. And I think Elizabeth Bennet is that character in mm -hmm. the Austin canon. Uh, the most enjoyable uh, let me see. You know, I think I have to go with, of all people, Miss Faith. She's the gossipy uh, spinster lady in Emma. And she only puts in a couple of appearances mm -hmm. in the book. But it was just delightful because her whole thing is she just goes and goes and goes and goes. And it's all good natured and positive And it just never ends. And there's no escape. Uh, that, that was so much fun. <laughs> that is like kind of a deep cut I guess but uh, I love that and the most challenging I think was Jonathan Darcy for reasons that probably mm -hmm. relate to another question you're going to ask but he's one of the two original characters who mm -hmm. is uh, and also one of the two main sleuths in the story yeah so we can kind of jump to that mm -hmm. um, in murder we meet Jonathan Darcy and we meet Juliet Tilney why choose a Darcy and a Tilney uh, let's see. First of all, and this probably is necessary, I sort of placed the books at different years throughout the, the period that Austin wrote them throughout the Regency. And we only have one book that has a definite date as to when it's taking place, and that's Persuasion. The others, you can kind of fudge. Now, there are hints that some are earlier and some are later. I put them roughly in that order, although I cheated a little bit by moving uh, Sense of Sensibility toward 
the end because I thought it would be interesting to catch up with these characters in slightly different places in their marriages and in their futures. Uh, I was very interested in what was going to happen with um, Colonel Brandon and Marianne shortly after the wedding. She's still very much in the process of falling in love with him. What is, what's going on with them? I wanted to know. But anyway, Elizabeth and Darcy, uh, I did put that book closer to when it was written, which was the 17, uh, late 1790s. And so that means that they have their adult son, Jonathan, with them. And the one character there without her parents uh, is <laughs> Juliet Tilney. Well, the one young character there without her parents is Juliet Tilney. She's the daughter of um, Catherine Moreland and Henry Tilney. And she's just turned 17 and I wanted to have her because these books, all of Austin's books feature at some point a young woman going off on her own or maybe with a sister to a place that she hasn't been before that challenges her in any way. Or maybe your uncle and aunt Gardner. But still, she goes to this new place and she doesn't have her usual support system around her. And something exciting happens. So you had to have that. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for Jonathan in particular, um, neurodivergent. Yes. Um, what was writing that like for you and what kind of research went into it and what was sort of important to you for marking that character? Yeah. Uh, it was interesting because I did not sit down and think I will write a neurodivergent character. That is a thing I'm going to do. My first thought with Jonathan is just, he's more Darcy than Darcy. Uh, like I wanted even Darcy to be like, please relax. Uh, but the more I started writing the scenes, I was going, well, why might he react in a certain way? And then it occurred to me that that was a potential explanation. And I thought that would be a really interesting thing to write about because, you know, it's very difficult in that they don't think of him as neurodivergent. That is a frame of reference they do not have at all. That's not going to be a thing in Jonathan's lifetime. You know, a lot of the sort of ways that we sort of understand this now and try to help people now would just not be on the table and there would also be a lot of assumption that some things that he really can't help are just him you know being peculiar or difficult for no reason um but on the other hand it was like you know this is also society some neurodivergent people not all by any means but some really like to have a sense of order and place and I was like, to live in an era and a, you know, in that class where you knew exactly what every day was going to be like. And if one day had a slight deviation, like say a country dance, you would know the steps to all the dance. You would have all the rules. You would have the protocol to follow. You'd know when somebody was going to touch you and for how long. And I was like, okay, that's actually really interesting. Somebody who would look at what I think most of us think of as a very confining kind of social culture. You know, it's a lot of it, the excitement of Austin is these real feelings sneaking in around that incredibly tight framework. But it'd be really interesting to have a character who loves that framework and really appreciates it uh, Mm -hmm. and understands it. So, you know, I did a lot of reading uh, after it was done. We did a sensitivity reader go over it and her input was really invaluable, though any remaining mistakes were my own. Um, the only points, which is, there were two points where I didn't take her advice just because she suggested maybe a way that Elizabeth or Darcy might respond better to Jonathan. And while for the most part, they are very loving and they've tried to work with him and by the you know, standards of their era, they're doing very well. I was like, they can't make the right call it every time because again, they don't understand this. They, they do not have that frame of reference. And so... There has to be a little bit of that kind of feeling around in the dark. Yeah. So kind of in connection to that and some of what you said earlier about sort of visiting these couples, you know, at later points in their life, right? We see a lot of different flaws Mm -hmm. than we wouldn't have seen in the books. All the novels kind of very famously end with a wedding, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So what was like thinking through that thought process or like, what was that like to think, okay, where are Fanny and Edmund going to be, you know, down the line? Like what, how has their relationship changed and where is it going to go? Yeah. It was interesting because um, 
you know, Jane Austen was very, very wise about human nature. Um, you know, she writes these characters that are so specific to time and place, but at the same time, we understand and we relate to because we, we understand those choices. She was very insightful in this way. And she knew that we don't just cast our flaws aside. You can get smarter about them. You can learn to recognize them a little earlier. The mistakes you make might be more subtle or more strongly motivators, but they don't go away. And so the couples, each of them is sort of facing a little bit of a challenge, and those challenges arise out of those flaws. Um, Elizabeth and Darcy have had a very happy marriage, but, you know, in the recent past, they've suffered a loss, and Darcy has really withdrawn himself and become very emotionally opaque again. Uh, this time, the, you know, the, the reason for it is so much bigger and so much more powerful. It's a situation which a lot of us were drawing, but Darcy definitely would. We know that he can do this. And, of course, it's very hard for Elizabeth to suddenly kind of have that door slam shut again and right when she needs something the most. Um, with Emma and Mr. Knightley, it was really fun to think, you know, the big thing is her meddling and he's always trying to stop. And I was like, okay, what if there's a scenario in which for once Knightley feels like he has to intervene in something. And he really feels like, the, you know, and it is in many ways, it is so much more serious and the stakes are so much higher in, you know, the argument for to do it is a lot higher, but also the risks are very much there. And also, how does Emma feel to be on the other side of going, like, you did what? You did what? <laughs> you know? uh, I thought that would be really interesting to turn that around and look at. Um, again, with Marianne and Brandon, are, are they truly in love? Does, you know, is, does she just see him as a figure of comfort? Does he just see her as Eliza? Or are they finding their way to each other as individuals? And then, of course, like you said, with Fanny, she says no once in one sort of part, and that's her action. But it's like, what, if anything, does it take her to say no to Edmund? Because she worships that guy uh, and has since childhood. Like, what does it take for her to do that? And mm -hmm. how does he respond? Because the no isn't at him in Van Steel Park. And, and he, he, doesn't, he doesn't take her as seriously as he should. But at the same time, he's like, give her time, let her think. Don't rush her. Don't do this. You know, he, what? What? How does it different when she does this to him? <laughs> yeah, I like the moment um, with Edmund and Franny, and it's not in relation to like the specific no that we're not spoiling. Um, but he thinks like ever, even Fanny has her limits, mm -hmm. right? And she right. she will have a moment like that can push her mm -hmm. too far or over some sort of decorous edge, I guess. Yes. Um, and I, I found those kind of conversations really interesting. I am right. a sucker for Colonel Brandon. <laughs> and, um, I, sense of sensibility is my favorite. <laughs> and I just love them. Um, when developing the mystery elements of the novel, what and who did you look to for inspiration? Oh, well, I mean, you know, I both did myself a favor and a disservice by just mainlining Agatha Christie, both reading and uh, the David Suchet Poirot, and also the really, really great uh, Joan Hickson marbles that they did back in the 80s. The recent marbles kind of, but Joan Hickson, oh my gosh, she's amazing. Um, and on the one hand, I already admired her and liked her and knew her to be a master. But once I was going like, whoa, there are clues everywhere, all the time, every place, I just gained this whole other level of respect and also this horrifying knowledge. It's like, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I did pay attention to certain kinds of feints and certain kinds of techniques mm -hmm. that were used in that and, uh, and some other, you know, more cozy mysteries that I read or viewed. And you know, sort of paid attention to how those were deployed and put them to work in here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. I... Yeah. <laughs> um, did you, when, so you said you've been kind of 
percolating with the t- the idea for a long time. Um, did you always know who the murderer was going to be, or did that change through your writing, change through your writing process? Um, I would say that when I realized who the murderer had to be was when I sort of hit the moment of, I'm, okay, now I need to write this book. Before it was like, wouldn't that be a great idea for a book? But then when you know the killer, it's like, now I have an idea for a book. Uh, that's kind of the crystallizing moment. Um, well, I was that any questions. Okay. And we are right on time. Go us. So, yeah. Jane also would be so proud. So, um, does anybody have any questions? I know you've all been thinking very hard. Okay. Okay. I'm going to repeat it just so the mic goes through them. But um, the question was, were there any characters you wanted to include, but couldn't fit in? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, there are so many characters. It would be so much fun to take a crack at, you know. Lady Catherine Burke, uh, Mr. Collins, that would be amazing. Uh, I definitely, like, early, early on, I kept trying to think of a way to have Jane and Bingley there, too. And I was like, no, Jane and Bingley would never kill anybody unless they, like, accidentally drop something on them. It's just not, they're not, they can't be suspected. Let them, let them go about their business. Um, Was there anything in your research that you found that didn't make it in? That you want to share? Yeah, tons of things. Um, you know, it's interesting because you think, well, it's the real world. You know, with Star Wars, sometimes I have to be like, what kind of ship would this be? What What is an alien with four arms and fur? You know, and, they, and they come back and tell me. I'm like, that's great. That's awesome. And this, it's like, oh, it's the real world. That's easy. But uh, as they say, the past is another country. And when you do research, you find people who very definitively state things that don't quite overlap. You know, would a lady drive this kind of carriage? Yes, no. Um, Very authoritative statements about what was and was not served at country house breakfasts that are not the same. And there appeared to be like no recognition that different people might eat different things for breakfast. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was as true then (laughs) as now. And particularly in an era when season, you know, seasonal vegetables and fruit would play a big role in your diet, location, everything would be very, very local. So, of course, there would be some variation. You find something that's credible. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, um, you know, there are some things I've gotten to work in for fun. But, uh, yeah, there's you have to read a lot of the background to sort of figure out what's going to be of use to you and and what's actually interesting in the story. Because sometimes you want to go on this Mm -hmm. tangent about this wacky thing you learned. It's like, this is... This is not interesting for the story. Get, come back. Thanks. Um, and so the question is, how difficult was it to make sure you stayed period in the writing? Um, I, for the most part, I think I was enough sort of absorbed in the books that... I was able to stay in it. The biggest thing actually was about word usage and phrase usage, which luckily they have this thing now where you can just type it in and Google will tell you how popular this phrase or word was in a year. And if it's flatlining, you know, in front of 1820, then I couldn't use it. Now, I'm sure there are some words I failed to check. You know, and I'm sure there's something in there that's wrong. I know we've let one term through that had the first use in the Oxford English Dictionary from 1822. And I was like, they were probably using it before that. They probably, two years, that that was in there. We, you know, I, I thought that was close enough. But, um, you know, um, one thing that did pass muster, I don't actually think it wound up in the book, but at one point I had a character saying, I guess. I thought that's really modern. I said, mm-hmm wrong. And then I looked and not only was it a thing people said in the Regency, it was a thing that Chaucer had people saying, I'm like, okay, I guess is pretty venerable. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know what word they didn't have? Motivation. Oh. Motive was there. Motivation was not. It was thrilling to discover that at the end of writing a mystery novel. <laughs> <laughs> but so we did. <laughs> <laughs> and that involves some edits. Uh, so, yeah, that's probably the hardest thing. You know, we know the things that sound sort of period or things, but little bits about English usage. Yeah, you know, the word blockheads, I think, is in there at one point. And it's like, blockheads. It's like, 
that's in Austin. She mm-hmm. she used that. I mean, it sounds very Charlie Brown. Um, oh, I mean, mostly the Austinisms. I think I think it's in there. Somebody saying that they didn't care two straws about something. I like that. I think we should bring that back. <laughs> Nice. What was one the, straw? Sure. Two. What was the eighteen twenty two word? I don't remember anymore. I'm sure it's in my email somewhere, and probably I will wind up using it in some book I write that's set in the seventeen hundreds, if that ever happens. With my luck, motivation. Um, any other? Yeah. It's, it's whatever is the right ending for the story. You know, um, a bittersweet ending is great if that's the way the story ought to end. There have been books I've read where I felt like the bittersweet ending was like tacked on. Like, this is more literary. And I'm just like, I don't even think that would happen. Why did you do that? But um, <laughs> it was a happy ending tacked on to a story that ignores a lot of the complexity. That also is uh, you know, whatever it is that feels like it most belongs. I will say that it is very satisfying to write a happy ending that feels genuinely earned. To really feel like, yes, the characters have gotten to this place. Uh, being able to do that feels really awesome. Oh gosh, I just finished a book I liked a lot called Woman Eating. I cannot remember the name of the author, booksellers. <laughs> <laughs> Woman. Yes, yes. Uh, I just finished that a couple of days ago. I thought it was excellent. I picked it up really not knowing what it was. First, I'm like, oh, you know, it's this interesting, um, you know, modern novel about this sort of artsy you know, 20 something in London whose mom has just gone into care and she's striking at her own. And then it's like, well, that bit of it seems a little weird. Wait, what? Is she a vampire? And yes, my God, okay. she, she is a vampire. And, but the thing is, really, it's the artistic coming of age finding herself. But, but she's finding herself as a vampire. I thought it was a really interesting mix. And I think she pulled the tone off. I thought that was awesome. Uh, let's see, I just read Eternal Life by, is it Dara Horn? Um, it is exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, these grandkids are, you know, fussing with their grandmother, like, when are you going to write a will already? You know, you know, you're going to die eventually. And it turns out she's from like 3000 BC (laughs) and she is tired of this. And, you know, it begins with like, she remembers her first son saying, she remembers her fifth son saying, da, da, da. her 68th son said, oh, da, da. you know, like literally just generations and generations. And she's been in this life for a while, but this time leaving is a little bit harder because now you need documents where hmm. she was always able to go and do stuff and just say, yep, that's me. Uh, and the things that she's lived through, uh, she lived in ancient Palestine and her father was a temple scribe. And so one thing I thought was really interesting is there are all these debates about biblical meaning, et cetera. And she was there when some things were being written down. You know, she's literally kind of like, that was a typo. <laughs> 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 or, there were three different endings to that that I saw that they were arguing about. You know, I, I thought that was really interesting uh, and great. And there's another really great book that I finished recently, and it's escaping my mind. But those two, I finished literally, I think, within the last week, and they were both excellent. I, woman eating sounds yeah, amazing. Um, other questions? Yeah. Uh, what I usually say is don't have an idea, like, 
you have different ideas and you begin to get a book when they meet each other and like start to hang out and party, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, this, oh, that, you know, an idea that literally I've been batting around for a couple of months. I'm telling the story because it's still almost no more than this and like a page of notes at this point, but I'd had an idea sort of knocking around for a little bit. And then this other idea was like, hey, oh, wow, that works. And then this Greek tragedy I had not thought about since college was like, can I play? You know, <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> you know, so maybe that's going to be a thing. Because, and I knew the minute that happened, I was like, okay, we're starting to actually have a party here. Uh, but yeah, it's when an idea begins to generate scenes. That's what it is for me. When it's no longer just kind of like, that would be a cool thing to play with. Or that's a line I can imagine the person saying, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But when all of a sudden it starts generating this sort of thing. That for me is a sign that it's ready to dig in a little bit. Uh, speaking of parties, how is writing the ball scene? Oh, it's always fun writing <laughs> the big ball. And having people dance and have fun. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I, I'm so glad really because that this was not in my life because I would guess about a decade ago I went to a party uh, for a book uh, mm -hmm. it was actually for Naomi Novik's Timorair series some of you will have read that and because that's set in the Regency era mm -hmm. as well uh, they actually had Regency dancers there and they would teach you the steps and one like you're always like oh these people didn't exercise they didn't do whatever <laughs> it is hard you know, because you, you're moving the whole time and within about 20 minutes, you're like, it's like aerobics that never ends, it never ends. And these people would go with that for like seven hours, I don't know. So, you know, if they're saying like a couple times, their characters like, oh, they danced all night and they did whatever. Like, they're also saying that person's really strong. <laughs> uh, and also I found out that as dancing Regency stuff goes, I am Mr. Collins, you know, wrong way, you know, and getting on people's feet, so. Uh, it's much more fun to write about. I would be mm -hmm. uh, a little bit inept. I, I love a good ball scene yeah. or masquerade whenever they throw those into. Mm -hmm. The Vampire Diaries had one like every three episodes. Oh, yeah. And it was, oh, yeah. I loved every one of them. Way back in my X Files fanfic days, and this was like in the 90s on all TV X Files created, we mm -hmm. came up with a term of fanfic terms. And the one that actually I still see circulate around sometimes was the Obligala. It's that party that the characters just have to go to and get dressed up for, you know, and it happens all the time in fanfic, but let's face it, like mm -hmm. you said, there are plenty of, of shows and movies that cook one up anyway. You know, it was not really credible that, that the FBI has an annual ball. Okay, sure, fine, but maybe it's a secret, but yeah, top top secret ball and also sometimes in your own life you would maybe not go to this thing where you have to dress up <laughs> you have to go and then you too have found the obligala mm -hmm. there you go. Um, any other questions yeah i ha usually have multiple things i'm working on but i try not to meet in the same stage of the book like right now I'm full out working on three things, but one of them is an outline, one of them is a draft, one of them is an edit, uh, and keep those straight. And um, it was actually really great, honestly, to kind of have this because um, you know, we were working on the High Republic during this time, and that's a really big publishing initiative. And we are so proud of it, and we are so happy it has done well. But in a lot of ways, like, it was a lot of work, I mean, a lot of extra work. We had meetings, we had flow charts, you, had to, <laughs> you know, get in and dig in on all of this. And going back to characters that I had already known for a really long time, sometimes it was like, you know, it was a nice, it was a nice moment. It was a break. It also worked out. I had the idea well before and even we set off the proposal just as people were like, there are cases of this virus in America. And then, you know, boom, lockdown, just as the book sells. And, you know, I realized, like, it, you know, being cooped up in the house for a long period of time, yes, you begin to think about murder. You do. <laughs> you know? Actually, my husband along and I got along great, but I knew from many people around us that this was not universally the case. So <laughs> it, it, it was a good time to work on that. I... I was trying to explain to my husband like the house party setup because he hasn't read much 
Regency. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, they would do these house parties. And he's like, isn't that every reality TV show you now watch where they just live in a house together? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, it's called Summer House. And I was like, somebody's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> um, it really was not the same. No. You had to behave yourself. There, was, you know, there were no points where I'm not here to make friends. You know, <laughs> yeah. that, uh, you were there to make friends. Yes. If you messed up, everybody you had ever met, and many people you didn't, would have the written copy of the letter with you messing up in it and would remember it for all time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't do well in that situation. I mess up a lot. Um, other questions? Yeah. Um, my apologies to any of you who've heard this story before, but it's an important story that we need to tell. Go back. Remember I said I used to write X-Files fan fiction on Alt TV X-Files Creative? That was the first creative writing. <laughs> oh, God, please don't. They were not good. They were not good. Um, they were bad. Uh, but, you know, you start with your bad words and you just keep going. But anyway, um, you know, I was supposed to be, I was in law school at the time, but I was spending much more time writing fan fiction on the internet. Uh, you know, yay. And then I just kept doing this and kept really enjoying it. And over time, the stories went from really pretty bad to mediocre, solidly mediocre. And it was like, hey, you know, I actually kind of like this one. This isn't bad. And then I had the first novel length idea. I was like, oh, I mean, literally, I was on a long car trip, and it felt like it fell on me during the drive. Um, and I was like, oh, because I'd always been like, how, do, how does anybody come up with enough story to fill a novel? That just seemed unfathomable to me. But then I, first time I had an idea that I was like, oh, that's it. That's, that's about the length that is there. That's the kind of complexity you need. That's what you need to be looking at. And I was like, okay, all right, I see that. And, you know, I kept working on things. And I finally, I had a story go over really big. And then I was like, okay, I need to do this. It was still a few years before I started writing professionally. Uh, my former agent really pushed me to go into it, which I'm very grateful for. Um, kept doing this for a few years, you know, wrote several things. Um, and then I got an email from Star Wars. Literally, it was at a gas station. And the thing is, I never thought they would come to me because they'd never done Young Adult, which at the time was all I had written. Even though I knew one of the main editors who works in Star Wars fiction, and I knew her because she was my beta reader on Alt TV X Files Creative. So when I was goofing off from law school, I was working toward my future career. <laughs> I love at schools, I'm like, everything I thought was career preparation was wasted time. Everything <laughs> I thought was wasted time was career preparation. Teachers hate that. They hate it. It worked for me. <laughs> I mean, I got to talk to my students today about how they're submitting their class project to a fan fiction site after the quarter's done. So they're, That's awesome. it's full circle. Yes. Then you would, you would be less appalled. I've had some teachers that would look like. <laughs> they're writing an avatar inspired choose your own adventure. Uh, the, 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 the avatar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I always say is a lot of people ask, why did you leave law to pursue writing? Lawyers never ask. <laughs> never. <laughs> they know. Um, I actually didn't leave the law to become a writer. I left the law to become a journalist because I was like, I need more student debt. Let's put it on there. Uh, and then I left that to be in legal marketing, which is just as much fun and, and as glamorous as you have always dreamed. Uh, but to be fair, like that job was the first job that I had as an adult that really didn't use up my creative juices sort of by the end of the day. So I would come home and work and I'd work on the weekends and I sold my first books while working there. So it actually turned out to be a really good job to support that. Uh, but yeah, I left the law because, you know, there are people who are very, very happy in the law, but they are a minority of lawyers and I was not among that minority. 
one other question. Yeah. Um, so what's up next for you? you what is up next out? for me? Uh, let's see. What is up next for me? It's all running better now. Uh, let's see. I am actually working on the sequel to The Murder of Mr. Wickham. I cannot announce the title just yet, but uh, I think you have an idea where it's going. Can you this book, possibly. Um, <clears throat> I am working on two other projects for, um, let's say, uh, intellectual property that is not Star Wars. Uh other things that I really enjoy mm -hmm. and, and happy to do something with. Taking a very brief break from Star Wars just because after like three straight years of the High Republic, it was sort of like I'm gonna I gotta I gotta have a moment. I gotta have a moment. Break after this weekend. Yeah. It's like a little bit of Yeah, this weekend is all Star Wars all the time. Um but <clears throat> I will obviously be returning to that. I'm working on some of my own other original stuff. And then there's that weird idea that a Greek tragedy just wants mm -hmm. to. I don't know when or how that's going to happen, but I'm busy. So I was right. Took the train here from LA. I was writing the whole thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice train ride. Oh, yeah. It's a great train ride, and it's much easier to work on a train than any other form of transit. That's for sure. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for um, having me. You're going to get sick of me and Nick because you're going to see us again <laughs> um, very soon. It's going to be good. I think my signing's on. Is it Thursday? It's Friday? Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Oh, it's I all think. four days at your group. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Friends forever. Yep. We should get bracelets. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you for joining us. Thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. Big round of applause. <laughs> Hello, people online. If you haven't yet, Get the murder of Mr. Wickham. The thing about my books is they're so giftable. It really is. One for you, one for a friend. <laughs> one for Aunt Lucy. Yes. 